want to be a part of the neighborhood. Um, so, also brings me to another point. Y'all, please be praying about whoever it is that we need to vote for. I mean, we ain't got much to choose from, unfortunately, but we got to choose the lesser of two evils, and, and the Lord's will is going to be done either way, even if it's not the one that we think that is the lesser of two evils. It's it's for a reason and for a purpose. God's Word goes into explaining how His people have to endure hard times and bad leadership time and time again because of things that have gone on because they have been quiet and sat still and not stood up uh, for the Lord and therefore allowing um, allowing the world to come in. Um, you know, God's not going to get told to get out, but so many times before He gets out and then He leaves us with what we're left with and that ain't nothing but a mess. So anyway, I'm done preaching on that. Alright, Acts, <coughs> excuse me, Acts chapter 12. We are moving right along. Uh, we've actually picked up some pretty good momentum there on the book of Acts. Um, I believe we've covered more in the last six months than we did in the first two years. Um, so we are looking at the book of Acts. Uh, to bring you up to speed, um, Paul has already gone through his conversion. Uh, he has seen the Lord on, on the road to Damascus. Um, Peter is now being convicted of uh, his prejudices. And what I mean by his prejudices is, yes, he's a Christian, but he was a Jew first. So he had the laws of Jews, uh, the Jewish laws and traditions that were ingrained in him from the time that he was born, um, that he was basically having to fight against because the grace of God goes against any kind of divisive there's a big word for you. I ain't even had a biscuit. Any kind of divisive um, law or tradition that there may be. So what, what Peter was dealing with was he was preaching the gospel, yes. He was sharing Jesus, yes. He was out there, you know, the highways and the hedges, yes. But he was only sharing with other Jews. He was not sharing with Gentiles. He was still following... He was still following the ways of the Jewish lifestyle based on the old laws. Um, so we see that he was sitting on a roof. God brought down, looked like a great old big sheep by the four corners, set it in front of him, all kinds of every type of critter you could think of, what crawls, flies, slithers, swims, or otherwise. And God says, Arise, Peter, kill, and eat. And he says, I ain't going to do it. And God said, Excuse me? Obviously, you forgot who I am. Peter said, I ain't going to do it. I ain't never messed with anything unholy or unclean in my life. And God said, how dare you call something unclean that I have deemed as holy? Because if I made it, then that means it's perfect in the way that it was made. No longer are you restricted on what you're going to eat. Well, Peter didn't understand exactly what um, the, man, there's another big word, ramifications or they come along with that. You might have had a Google that one, Jason. Um, the ramifications that come along with that one because um, what it was talking about was not just the food. It wasn't just the fact that, yes, he was a Jew, and now he got to eat pork chops, praise God. Yes, he had a Jewish background and was brought up that way, but now he can have bacon for breakfast, praise God. But what it was talking about is that there was no difference between man. There was no difference between nationalities, between, um, you know, color, creed, race, it didn't matter. And specifically, God was talking about the Gentiles, which were basically anybody that was not a Jew. So not only did he see this vision, then he gets called out to go preach at a Gentile's house, preaches to the whole family, to everybody that was there, and he sits down and has a meal with them. Well, he's all excited. He goes back and tells the folks, Back in the church of Antioch, which, by the way, is where the term Christian was first used, um, about what was going on, and everybody copped attitude with it. Well, what are you doing over there messing with the Gentiles? You know you ought not mess with that kind of people. Them people ain't right. You know, mama and them wouldn't like that. that how, how would your mama feel if she knew you was over there eating with them old nasty, dirty Gentiles, them pig-eating folks? Well, 
He's sitting there looking in. Let me tell y'all what happened. And he goes through the whole thing, explains to him the situation and the fact that the Holy Spirit then fell upon him. On the Gentiles. <clears throat> Whenever they accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles. The same way that the Holy Spirit fell on Peter and the rest of the disciples in the room that day on the day of Pentecost. With the flaming tongues and everything. And they sat back and they said, shine. Well, if God's going to do that, then I reckon it must be all right. Well, yeah, I reckon it is. And I said, praise God for that day. Because had it not been for that day, we wouldn't be here. Because we are Gentiles. So, <clears throat> of course y'all know that no good deed goes unpunished. Whenever it comes to the book of Acts, especially Peter and Paul and John and all these boys. They were forever getting into trouble. And the crazy thing is, they were minding their own business, not bothering a soul in the world, doing exactly what God had called them to do. But yet they were still getting in trouble. Why? Because when you stand for God and you preach the true, complete word of Jesus Christ in the gospel... You are going to be persecuted. Someone is going to come against you and say, well, that offends me. Well, I'm sorry, darling. Pull up your big girl panties and deal with it. You ain't got to listen to me. That's the beautiful thing about America. If you don't like what I'm saying, go somewhere else. Because I got as much right to stand here and say what I'm going to say as what you do. But the problem is, <clears throat> nowadays, we're not willing to allow each other to have the same privilege of the same rights that we all have. You have rights and privileges so long as it doesn't offend somebody else. Once somebody else gets offended, then it's a problem. But it's only a problem when you're a Christian and when it's the Word of God and it's going against what the establishment wants. And when I say the establishment, I'm talking about Satan himself and the lies that he has impregnated the government and society with these days and the way that he has tried to delude them down and the ways that he has tried to boil us alive, starting off in a lukewarm water and then raising the heat to it, we get desensitized to these things. Because of what we watch on TV, because of what we hear in the songs, so on and so forth. I had a very interesting conversation <clears throat> with my buddy Chris Tooley. i got to give him another shout out. Boy, I love my boy Tooley, son. Now, I'm a good indeed, based on where I'm standing, and I've told him this, and he'll tell you this himself. He is as lost as a goose in a snowstorm. He's going to bust hell wide open if he doesn't accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. But he doesn't believe. And he'll tell you he doesn't believe. And I know he doesn't believe, and he knows he doesn't believe. But he knows that I do believe. But we have an understanding that we respect each other's right to believe or not to believe. By doing that, it allows us to have adult conversations instead of just picking and poking him. Man, you heard my feelings. Blah, blah, blah. I'm not talking to you. You can't be my friend no more. We have excellent conversations. We had a conversation the other day. He, he likes listening to rap. Some of it, you know, I listen to. Some of it's funny. I might even get out there and shake my booty to it every now and then. But it's not it's not my number one choice of music. And he asked me, he said, why don't you like rap? And I said, well, because these are the main topics of most rap songs that are on the radio right now. Um, you know, doing what you got to do to make the amount of money that you want, killing folk to get in the way, um, uh, demeaning women, uh, trying to get your groove on with everybody that you can find, you know, so on and so forth. Partying, smoking, drinking, getting your swerve on, you know, all them things. He said, well, you know what, that's funny. He said, because you just described the top five songs on country music radio. And I stopped and I said, I will be dog. <laughs> You're exactly right. All you got to do is take Snoop Dogg and throw you a pickup truck and a couple of four wheelers and you got dang on Florida Georgia line. That ain't no difference. Every last one of them talking about sinning. And, and we sitting there going along with it. Why? My excuse when I was growing up when Mama said, you don't need to listen to that song. Why, Mama? What's wrong with it? And you listen to the words? No, I don't listen to the words. I just listen to the beat. Bull hockey. 
That's a bunch of horse doo doo. That's not true. You might not think you're listening to the words, but those words are getting stuck in your head. And they are making a difference in your life. They are changing, or maybe they're shaping and forming the way that you think. And the things that you think are acceptable and that you find okay. What is considered taboo for one generation is considered acceptable by the next. And we are on a slippery slope heading straight for hell if we don't turn around now. I'm just saying. I mean to get all fired up, but I'm just trying to bring y'all up to speed. And by God, it's in the Word, so I'm going to say it. So there it was. It's been said. Now, so... Peter's got all this taken care of. He's been doing what he needs to do. Things have been great. He's got everybody at church at the church of Antioch straightened out. They're all on board. So um, you know, all's well in the kingdom. And then you hear the music in the background. Dun 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 dun. dun. Here it comes. Here. Lord have mercy, not Herod again. I thought we got rid of him a couple hundred years ago. To be sure, we're not Herod again. Alright. I'm only going to make it through three verses tonight. So, I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. And then you all understand what's going on here. So, what time? Somebody tell me what time it is. 7.35. Alright, good deal. Um, so that means i got a good hour worth of preaching. So y'all hold tight. Alright, uh, chapter 12 and verse 1. Now about that time. Well, what time is it? Well, that means you need to go back to chapter 11 and read and see what time it is. It was the time that the disciples were moving forward, were spreading out, were encouraging one another, were starting to preach to the Gentiles, and the Christian movement was picking up momentum and was moving forward. So that's what time it was. And Herod said, ain't nobody got time for that. So what did he do? He went out there and he was going to start regulating on some people. Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James the brother of John, put to death with a sword. That means decapitated, deheaded, cut off. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded, proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of the unleavened bread. When he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after Passover to bring him before the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church of God. Now let me give you a little background of what's going on here. Herod. Herod was from a group of people that was known as Edomites. E-D-O-M-I-T-E. Now, this group of people came from the lineage of Esau. Alright? Esau was the twin brother of Jacob. So now y'all go back to the Old Testament and y'all go to looking up Jacob and Esau and see what kind of hard times was going on there and disagreements that they had and, 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 and even conspiracies and whatnot. Man, it's, it's, good, it's a good read, I'm telling you. Jacob and Esau. So when Esau was sent out, all of the people that came from his lineage, they actually became a group of people almost like a nationality, like their own country. They were called Edomites. And it says that when Esau was born that he, was, he had a reddish color to him. Um, so everybody from that group kind of that was the, the skin color that they had. So Herod wasn't was an Edomite. So the Jews already had that against him because they weren't real big fans of Esau to begin with. Y'all have to go back and read for yourself why. That's your homework for this evening. Because um, I'm, I'm not going to take up any more time than, than what we already have. Um, also. All right, so far 
we've gone through three Herods. You got Herod Great, you got Herod Antipas, and you got Herod Agrippa. Not like you a grip of the hammer before you a hit of the nail. But that's what they call me. Alright, so Herod the Great. Now watch this. Herod the Great was... I'm not going to use Herod in front of the name so we can keep him straight, alright? So Agrippa was the grandson of the Great. Alright? The Great was the Herod that sent out saying that every boy under the age of two years old is to be killed whenever he was trying to find Jesus. Alright? Then, you got Antipas, who is the great's son. Well, guess where he was involved at? He was involved in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The leaders brought Jesus to Pilate. Pilate said, it's not my place. you got to take it to the higher court. He sent him to Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas said, I ain't dealing with it. Send it back down there because he didn't want to get his hands dirty. Here's another little known fact for you. His sister's name was Herodias. She was the woman that called for the head of John the Baptist. Now, we got, excuse me, I got ahead of myself, got ahead of myself. Antipas uh, heard the case of Jesus. Agrippa, his sister, was the one that required the head of John the Baptist. Y'all remember John the Baptist was preaching and she just got tore all out the frame and said, I ain't calling down for nobody. Ain't nobody going to call me. The only way I'm going to call down is if you give me that man's head on a silver platter. So what did they do? They went out and they got John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus Christ, cut his head off and give it to the woman. That's one crazy chick. Just saying. So now we're talking about her brother, Herod Agrippa, who the Jews didn't like because he had lineage from Esau, who they had issue with, but yet he was put in charge over their region and their area. So every chance he had to try to get in good with the Jews, he was going to do it. Because even though the Christian religion was starting to, to pick up steam and move forward, it still was not the predominant prevailing group of individuals. They were still a minority. It was still in its fledgling stage. Everybody who was anybody was still a Jew or a Roman. That's just the way it was. So, now about that time, Herod Agrippa, the king, laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order, whenever it talks about church, that means Christians, in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. Hey, William, brother. All he's doing is preaching. <coughs> well, let me share something interesting with you. Somebody look up for me the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 through 40. Um, so you've got James and you've got John. Um, these boys were known as the Sons of Thunder. Oh, I like that. There was also a point in time where they asked for special treatment or placement in the kingdom of God. Who's got Mark chapter 10? Pulled up. Anybody got that pulled up for me? Alright, you mind reading that for me? Verses 35 through 40? Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 40. Yes, sir. 35 starts off by saying, James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant that we must sit, one on your right and one on your left, 
in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drank, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? They said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you shall drink, and you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. But to sit on my right or my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. All right. James and John go to Jesus and say, Hey, brother, we are so committed to you that we want you to go ahead and assign us a place in heaven where one of us will sit on the right and one of us will sit on the left. And Jesus said, Boys, you, you don't know what you're asking for because what comes along with that is some pretty crazy stuff. And they said, We still want it. So, verse 2, verse 1, I, I like to call that family tradition. Because it was Grandpa Herod, Daddy Herod, and Grandson Herod that was causing problems. Well, now, verse 2, be careful what you wish for. Because by going back to Mark chapter 10, we see James and John asking Jesus for special preference. And Jesus says... Are you able to drink of the same cup that I drink from? Are you able to be baptized with the same baptism that I've been baptized? He's warning them. He's like, fellas, you better rethink this thing. Because there's a whole lot more to it than just having your name put on a plaque somewhere. I mean, this isn't just a, um, a, a position uh, or a title where you can walk around and say, oh, look at me, you know, I'm Sunday school administrator. Well, I'll a lot more that comes along with it. And he warned them. But yet they still said, yes, we're willing to do it. And he says, all right then. He says, you're going to have to drink the same cup and be baptized by the same baptism. And right here, be careful what you ask for because you just might get it. James just got it. James got beheaded because of his conviction and because of his willingness to follow Jesus Christ. He lost his life. He was a martyr. He lost his life for the Lord. Now, if you go on over into Revelation, which we talked about a couple times ago, it's not Revelations, it's not multiple Revelations, it is the... Jill, get down off that chair. It is the Revelation of John. Uh, what John are we talking about? We're talking about James's brother. Well, how did John get in the position to have the revelation? He had been um, exiled to the island of Patmos. That means there ain't no water, there ain't no food, there ain't no Walmart, there ain't no sheets, there ain't nothing. There's dead people, disease, and animals, and that's it. Well, how do you know there's dead people? Because that's where they sent the people that they didn't want to deal with anymore. It, it was like, instead of killing you, instead of putting you in prison, they sent you out to, to an abandoned, barren island that you would suffer and die from the elements. All right? So that's where John was. But we see that through both James and John, even though they had to drink of that same cup, and even though they were both, even though they were both um, criticized and ridiculed for their beliefs, there was still a testimony that was given. There was still a testimony of Jesus Christ that was carried on. James was known as one of the martyrs. He was known as one of the heroes. His life was put out there for everybody to see as an example. Yes, you make mistakes, but God still uses you in the great things that can be done. John was used uh, by God to give him the revelation of what the end times were to look like. So yeah, in a way it kind of sucks. But on the same hand, what the world means for evil, God can use for good. And then verse 3. So verse 1, family tradition of the Herods. Verse 2, be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. But also be mindful of your situation and pay attention closely 
to the details around you because where God has put you, you may be there for a purpose and you can be used for His glory. And in verse 3, when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of the unleavened bread. So Herod realized that by persecuting the Christians, he was gaining the acceptance or at least the toleration of the Jewish people. So he decided he would move forward with this. He's got a great plan put out there. I mean, it's an entire conspiracy against Peter. We'll not get into it tonight, but if you want to know what's going on, I encourage you to read on through chapter 12 and see exactly what takes place. A couple of questions were brought up to, by me, to me, from me, on verse 3. Question number one is, why was James killed, but Peter was spared? Was... Was Peter favored by God more than James? Did Peter still have more to do but hadn't completed everything? Was James finished with everything that God had asked him to do? I can't answer that question. It's back to the age-old question that humans have been asking for thousands of years. Why do bad things happen to good people? Problem with that question, number one, there is no such thing as a good person. We are inherently evil from the very core of our beings. The only way that we are good is because of the God that is in us. Now, around here, you know, country folk, country talk, I, I say it all the time and I agree with it 100%. There's some folks out there, they, they're, they're just good people. They're good folks. They've got a good heart. They give you the shirt off their back. Maybe they're a little misguided. Yes. But when you come down to it, no matter how many attaboys you get in this life, if you don't have Jesus, it doesn't do you any good whenever you stand before God. It makes no difference how good of a person you are on this earth. If you don't have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're going to go to hell. It's just that simple. Go back and look at Job. Job had it all, and it was all taken away. Why? For the amusement of God, because God got bored? Not at all, because God knew that Job would be an example of how to stand up under persecution, especially undeserved persecution. Let me take it a step further. We always pick on Job when something happens like that. How about Joseph? Joseph in a coat of many colors. He was favored by his father. His brothers hated him. They dug a hole and threw him in it and told their daddy he got ate by a wild animal. And then sold him into slavery. And then the story goes on from there. And it is year after year after year that he is sold into slavery, that he is mistreated, that he is put in dungeons, that he is persecuted, that he is accused of things that he did not do until finally, one day, he is in the position that God had called him to be in. To extend grace to the very people that threw him in the, in the pit to begin with. How does stuff happen like that? I don't have an answer. But I can't answer that. I wish I could. If I could have a solid black and white foundational answer to that, I would be a billionaire from the book sales of the answer that I would write to that question. But all I can say is this. When you choose to stand for Jesus, you're going to suffer persecution. It's going to come in many different forms. Be prepared and be unwavering at all times, giving God the glory for where you are. Because no matter how bleak the situation may look, there's always something that you can give God praise for. 
Heavenly Father, I praise you for this evening. I praise you for this message. I pray that it will challenge us. God, that we will take it and share it with someone this week. God, bring someone across our paths that we may be able to share this message with. Father, that it might encourage them and point them in the right direction. Or God, maybe it might make them mad. It might make them fight mad. But Lord, it would be because it convicts them. And Lord, if that conviction turns into repentance, then praise the Lord. Your word has done what it, what it needs to do. God, wherever it is that we are, Lord, allow us not to become stagnant. Lord, allow us not to become comfortable and allow us not to become sloths in where we are. But Lord, allow us to always be moving forward for you, always looking for new ways to serve you, and God, making sure that you are first and foremost in our lives. Lord, allow us to be the shining light in this community. Help us to serve our families first, our, our community, Lord, and all of those that you bring across our paths. God, allow us to be your hands and feet, that we would be able to love someone else the same way that you've loved us. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. As always, I love you, but most importantly, God loves you. Y'all have a great rest of the week. We are not meeting Sunday morning. Sunday mornings are done with, so I will see y'all Sunday night at 6 o'clock. Awesome.